Uh, welcome, welcome to our community seminar today. Today we have um, Pastor Morgan as usual, and uh, we have uh, an, a guest from uh, Kenya uh, joining us uh, from Kagamega is uh, Mr. Ruben Nyangweso. He's a community pharmacist, and we are going to be discussing how Africans and uh, black Americans and uh, African immigrants view the, va the vaccine and how we as the, as the people who are involved can make sure that people get the right information and that when the vaccine is available, we can get it to them at appropriate uh, in appropriate uh, times and places. So first, we want to welcome Ruben. You are the, the guest on the, on the show. Introduce yourself a little bit, and then uh, we'll go to Morgan, and then we start, we move on from there. All right, thank you, David. Uh, as uh, you heard, my name is Ruben. Uh, I operate a community pharmacy, which is right in the um, rural part of uh, Kenya and Kakamega. Uh, just beyond the community pharmacy, we also have integrated services like uh, uh, a lab, family planning. Um, we do lots of uh, clinical services, more so on tropical diseases like uh, malaria and um, other infectious diseases that are common within uh, this kind of setup. So um, I'm glad to be in this uh, webinar now to really hear firsthand from people who are right uh, in the thick of things at the US. And then uh, I will also chip in with what I think is the situation in Kenya, uh, particularly in rural Kenya. Thank you. You are welcome, Ruben. Uh, Pastor Morgan, just say uh, one minute. Pick yourself. Tell us, tell us about the New Life Foundation recovery. And actually, I'll push push you a little bit because you are you are you are you, you are you are a registered facility, and you know we have to vaccinate seven billion people on this on this earth. So every professional will have to pitch in. How do you see yourself pitching in? Uh, Dr. Makobe, uh, Ruben, it's nice to have you, and Dr. Makobe, it's nice to be here today, as always. Um, to our audience, uh, it's nice to be with you again. My name is Morgan Icone. I am the director of New Life Foundation Recovery, uh, which is... Uh, New Life Foundation is a uh, registered... Um, certified and licensed um, drug and alcohol and mental health treatment services um, here in the state of Delaware. We are championing the cause for Black, Indigenous, and people of colors um, um, as it relates to the issue of uh, vaccination. Our hope is that our people will uh, uh, get on board. Your voice is going and coming. Your voice is. Our voice is going and coming. Yeah, your voice is yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be losing. Okay. You. I'm not sure why, but let me. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. It's yeah. better now. I think it was the earphone. It is now we're connected. So, as I was saying, New Life Foundation, we are. Um, um, truly engage in um, helping Black, Indigenous, and people of color understand the necessity for mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment, as well as uh, creating a lot of awareness and sensitization as it relates to this COVID vaccination and uh, COVID itself. We are looking forward to playing a major part in the provision of vaccination. Um, hopefully to go through the registration process with uh, Delaware Department of Health and Social Service and Human Services um, to focus and target on our population, thereby creating an optimal um, 
realization of the um, CDC and FDA um, intent to get people vaccinated. And um, that's, that's who we are, that's what we'll do. And hopefully during, during this conversation- we'll Thank talk. you very much for the introduction. We're going to come back to you. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, COVID-19 and vaccination. But first of all, I want to hear from Ruben, um, what is the, the opinion on the ground now in, in, say, in rural Kakamega, in rural Kenya? Do the people think uh, COVID is real or do they think that it's something happening elsewhere? Uh, COVID uh, is real by any standards in Kenya, there's been a lot of um, uh, realization that this is a actually an existing uh, disease because we have lost people. Uh, we've seen people admitted, there are those who come out of hospitals. So at least every homestead knows somebody who has had an encounter with a COVID patient or actually a number of people have lost loved ones and um, people who are close to them. So in Kenya, particularly where we are in the rural part of uh, Kenya, it's actually uh, real. Having okay. said that, mm -hmm. uh, right now we're still grappling with just how to manage the cases that are there. Uh, the facilities are uh, wanting as we speak now, you know that there is a crisis in the means of health in Kenya. Uh, doctors just called off their strike the other day. We have clinical officers who are still on strike. We have nurses who are on strike. So that even um, with a few facilities that we have, we be, Kenya is overwhelmed. And then the situation has been made worse by uh, a dispute uh, regarding the doctors, they think that they're not getting uh, PPEs or if the PPEs are there, they're not being distributed well and they don't come on time. Uh, that is, situation has been made really critical to the extent that people are not thinking now about vaccination. The, uh, that, is, that is a call too far. We have not had a proper plan from government telling the people that uh, officially this is what we're doing, maybe in terms of timeline and in terms of quantities and in terms of prioritization. Uh, other than what we see maybe on the press, but somehow there will be uh, some doses that are likely to arrive uh, early in the year. It means that um, out of, because they are talking about 24,000 doses, uh, 24 million, 24 million doses. And you know, Kenya has a population of 50 million. So we are yet to know how this will even be done. So people are not talking about this. They're not talking about it, not because they don't think it's there, not because they don't like it, not because they don't believe in it, but it's because uh, it's, it's actually, it may turn up to be a luxury to most Kenyans. People will not afford and they may not be anywhere near in the line to get that. You know, Ruben, uh, COVID-19 is such a disease that uh, unless everybody's safe, nobody's safe. So the, the, the point, the fact that um, a few people may get vaccinated it does not mean that the rest of the people who are not vaccinated shouldn't be vaccinated. What, what, what I would like to know, what we'd like to, to hear from you is, um, okay, uh, the simple things like self -dist uh, social distancing, wearing masks, okay? Wearing masks, social distancing, and washing hands, uh, just generally san sanitization. Those are the simple things that uh, we ask, the, the behavioral change that we ask people to to engage in, are they able? Are we able to be able to get those those done, or is it a little a bridge too far? 
<laughs> uh, David, to some extent, given the way things work in Africa and say in Kenya, mm -hmm. people have tried to keep the protocols. They have tried to adhere to hand washing. They've tried the uh, social distancing and uh, they do wear masks. However, it's not to the level that you would expect. Take a case where people go to an open air market, yeah. say almost every week, and um, you would find that there are about uh, 4,000 people, and out of the 4,000 people, uh, possibly less than 10% could be having masks. And those masks, to me, they could actually again be uh, a health risk because somebody may use a disposable mask for more than a month and just carries it around to try and beat uh, the law because it's illegal not to have a mask, but it is not illegal to have a dead mask, I would say. <laughs> so those, <laughs> those, those, uh, they, they are there. People try, but we have a limitation. What can actually be done? Uh, now, Morgan, what, what do you think? I mean, we have a situation whereby uh, in Kagamega, people are trying. They, they, they really want to wear a mask. They want to do self-distancing. And they want to make sure that they are, they are washed their hands. But they don't have the, the resources to do it. And we have a situation in the US where we stay where we actually can be able to afford masks, we can be able to afford self-distancing, we can be able to wash hands every day. But we have a situation where people are saying it is, they, it is, they, have, they are free to do whatever they want. How do you relate those first? Um, I, I am going to um, uh, begin by saying that I'm really, really moved. Um, hearing the things that uh, Ruben is stating to be facts uh, on the ground in Kenya and in Kakamega where he is. And I think that is a fact that uh, runs across African continent and most of um, what presupposedly they call third world countries. The lack of resources um, is a very big issue when it comes to public health measures being implemented. Um, political uh, insensitivity of the leaders being unable to understand that receiving aid and support from World Health Organization and various world agencies, and they ends up not utilizing it for the purpose uh, truly is hurting their constituents and destroying the very intent to curb and to remediate this virus. Uh, to that end, I, I want to say that um, I'm going to take a different approach. This is a world pandemic. This is not a regional pandemic. This is not an American pandemic. This is not an African pandemic. If there is no universal approach and leadership in the highest echelons of leadership, this thing is going nowhere. I'm not a bearer of false news and evil news, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. We live in an ecosystem. Whatever goes on in Kakamega is going to find its way in Nairobi. Whatever finds its way in Nairobi is going to find its way in Washington, D.C., or in JFK, or in any... So, we are all interconnected. So the idea of lack of leadership or a comprehensive approach that is empowering people who are within the rural areas where these needs are more profound uh, is really a negative, um, it's very negative because it's not gonna help the situation. So my hope is that Somehow, World Health Organization and various international organizations and humanitarian organizations begin to find ways to rechannel their resources, 
to the rural communities and partner with rural community leaders and rural community agencies that know their people, can talk to their people and convince them. How can somebody wear a mask for one month? That in itself is, is, is just, it's wrong, it's bad, you know? And the person is not wearing this mask for one month because he won or she won or because they cannot afford buying and changing disposable masks. And I, I mean, for goodness sake, it is so unfortunate that there has not really been a comprehensive attention that has been given to this virus. This nationalized, nationalistic approach is not going to help to stop you know, away this virus. Pastor, we had a situation like that during the border time. If, you, if we had approached this the way we have approached a border, so that we knowing that wherever if a border exists in any one spot it will exist everywhere, okay? So I think that um, moving forward in the new, new year, just like we are talking to Ruben in Kakamega, we will be able to engage every health leader all, all over, all over. You we will bring somebody in Nigeria or somebody from Ghana so that we, we have a comprehensive, because you know what? There is nobody, if we don't do it, there's nobody who's gonna do it, you understand? The, the idea that World Health Organization or the USID or the American government is going to do, American government doesn't do anything unless the American people tell it to do it. You understand? And since if 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 people in Kagamega are not safe, people in 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 the middle town are not safe because at one time somebody will move will move across and I'll bring it. So what I'm think what I'm thinking is now uh, the US has moved uh, has moved from uh, social distancing wearing masks, uh, making sure our hands are clean and stuff like that, to now having a vaccine. We also had a situation whereby black, indigenous, and people of color in the US have been slightly resistant, but they are moving towards it. Yesterday, we had a meeting, and I could see people uh, talking about the hesitancy and the reason why the people are hesitant, because of historical reasons, but people are moving on. What I want to see is, how can we Given the the challenges that uh, say rural Kakamega has, how can we sitting here be able to work with them to make sure that they move forward and we can be able to get the vaccine to, to them when it comes so that everybody is ready for it, like the, like during polio time. I, I think that's a very good question, and I think what we're doing now and what you had uh, I elucidated in your li um, line up to the question is important. Uh, we, you and I are not in Kakamega. Ruben is, he understand what is currently going on there. He understand the fears, he understand the challenges. If we're gonna be effective, we have to continue in this level of engagement. Reaching to community leaders where they are and foremost, find out what their challenges are and what the situation on ground is. Uh, impository intervention does not work in this setting because when you impose things and intervene in situations that you're not familiar with, you miss everything. So I think foremost what we're doing is very important. Secondly, uh, those of us who are privileged to be out here in the West needs to start an immediate mobilization in terms of how can we come together to create both the awareness and push for the resources necessary to empower, for example, Ruben and those in Kakamega to be able to be in position. Now, the vaccines that we're talking about, both of them require constant electricity and a level of refrigeration that may not exist in Kakamega or in some part of Africa. So these are logistics that conversations needs to be heard around to ensure that people in these rural settings have these setups in place before you are talking about sending vaccines to them. Now we're not gonna go beyond, we're not gonna just do that without empowering them through
uh, community education and sensitization, where they are able to meaningfully engage with folks at home by way of interpreting the data, explaining it in their context, in their language, in their setting, and assuring them by being the first to be vaccinated and keeping on that conversation of the necessity of vaccination. So this is an ongoing uh, effort that requires collaboration. And those of us up here needs to engage. Uh, we know, and you know very well, and as I know, that uh, if we're going to depend on our politicians back home, our people will die before they get any help. And if we truly want to remediate this issue, we need to begin to do these things that I am trying to suggest. This level of conversation with people on the rural ground, their empowerment, our ability to start having conversations about how to provide them with the logistics and the necessary setup infrastructurally that would help when the vaccine gets there. Take, for example, my own rural place. I was speaking with my elder brother yesterday in Germany. I don't know how many years they have not had electricity. Okay, he was telling me, oh, finally, uh, his son who is still back home was telling him uh, they had light. And that is not steady electricity. So how do you score? How do you ensure that the vaccine is, is safe and is going to be what it ought to be when the infrastructures are not there? And now you cannot depend on the government. So identifying with local leaders who are honest and genuinely concerned, empowering them and building the capacity and the infrastructure that they need is the only way forward if this thing is going to be remedied. Ruben. Uh, you just said that uh, the government, uh, and I saw, I saw, I saw the the, the order. They, they said they ordered uh, twenty four million from Gavi, but considering how they handled the uh, the PPEs, and um, I I don't know that you do you think that it would be prudent for the population to put a lot of stock in to let the government handle this or do you think uh, 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 a, a private sector partnership would be better? When we're talking about uh, Madonna, they said that uh, in phase three, they had um, 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. They would have liked to have had between 25% to 13% uh, of black people, mm -hmm. but they only managed to get 10. Mm -hmm. What do you think about um, suggesting to them that like increasing that number by say ha having, having test sites in Africa say, say so that we can be able, instead of out of 30, they only, they only had um, three black people, okay? Oh, and then uh, I think they had 25% uh, Latinx. So what about uh, increasing the participants by, in, by uh, adding some sites in, in, in Africa so that we have a larger number of, maybe they may, they may not be American, but they are black. So that will work with them. What, do, what is your opinion on that? I, I think, you know, you had uh, raised that question uh, in one of the previous sessions you had. Mm -hmm. And I remember that Dr. Kibeso mm -hmm. uh, explained some of the logistical challenges yeah. uh, that uh, uh, Pfizer um, may have thought about mm -hmm. um, and the processes involved in... Um, uh, navigating through the, uh, the bureaucracy of African governments to do certain things. Um, I think that foremost, we need to begin to create more consciousness of globalization mm -hmm. and to see how um, things that happen in one part of the globe is 
inevitably going to transpose itself into the other part of the globe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it is important that there yeah, begins to be a proactive uh, disposition in, in thought processes and infrastructural uh, uh, building as against waiting until when the need arises. If, say, Pfizer begin this year to look for ways to build capacity for uh, such uh, modalities, like say, when they will need to have more participants of black people in any clinical trial. You don't wait until the need emerges. Mm -hmm. If you begin ahead of time and build infrastructures and get through the processes, once the need emerges, you already have that existing as against waiting until there is a need where you are not gonna be able to do that. That's on one hand. On the other hand, is this issue of awareness and sensitization. You know, the more we build awareness among our people, the clinical trials is not injurious to them and how people who have gone through such clinical trials speak of the experiences, it will open up that window of desire uh, within Black people and Black communities to be part of clinical uh, trials. And I think thirdly and finally will be that uh, scientists that are people of color needs to not just write scientific journals and publish, but they need to start seeing the necessity to engage in their communities. You know, I was watching the, uh, the Zoom conference you sent to me I never knew until I watched it mm. that the young lady who pioneered all this was black. <laughs> yes. yes, you know how much different that meant to me. Just yes. hearing her mm -hmm. and seeing her. Mm -hmm. So if she can, such individuals get involved and and be part of the conversation in community levels, it will change a lot of things. It will really help in resolving some of these hesitancy issues. Ruben, are you back? Yes, I can hear you now. But, okay. Uh, what, I what, what, say, what Morgan said, yeah. What I was, what we're saying is this: um, uh, the Moderna vaccine, the U.S. Moderna vaccine, when they, they were in phase three, they had wanted to have between twenty-five percent to 15, 13 percent of black people because the population in the U.S. is thirteen percent black, but the the virus has affected. The, the virus has affected, those affected by virus are 25% black. So they had wanted the ratio between 25 to 13% participants, but they only get got 10. And uh, they got 25% Latinx and then the rest were white. What we're asking is, do you think that um, given the fact that the vaccine is working, if say Madonna or some other person who are interested to make sure that the number of black people in the trial were in Greece. Do you think, say, uh, Ruby, uh, Ruby and uh, the community, community, uh, community, or uh, other community health organizations would be able to be um, uh, uh, to be open to such a uh, avenger? Well, well um, one, there would be a logistical problem with the vaccine that is being used in North America, mm -hmm. because I believe Moderna uh, is. Uh, we're talking about the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine requires uh, storage of minus 70 degrees. Yeah. Uh, so as things stand, I don't think that is the most suitable vaccine that we would be looking at in Africa. We, 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 we are like thinking of um, what is now being produced by Oxford University, I think in conjunction with a, uh, a vaccine that would be suitable in our circumstances in Africa, where you will not, it's not possible to get a facility anywhere in Kenya that would comfortably in the rural area keep the vaccines at minus 70 degrees. Um, now with that in mind, we do not know whether say organizations from North America would then be willing to source vaccines that actually would work well in uh, Africa, given that most of these facilities 
we may want to look at as a platform for the rural population actually do not have the facilities. They may need something. I know it's not very possible, a vaccine that is safe, say at room temperature, not necessarily one that is kept in that strict cold chain um, method that is applied everywhere. But I it would the, be a very good idea. I think the Madonna, Madonna vaccine, what, what, they, uh, what they said that, no, even the Pfizer vaccine, what I heard yesterday was that uh, it, uh, you, you remove it from the frozen time, it, it, uh, it thaws for about, an hour, for about two hours, then when it thaws for two hours, after thawing for two hours, you keep it refrigerated and it's good for five days. You understand? So it's stored under those frozen conditions, but before you use it, you have to thaw it for, for two hours. And then well, after, after that, it's put in a refrigeration and it's good for five days. Basically, uh, me, I am a person who believes that all challenges can be solved by people. <laughs> so uh, I can see a truck, a refrigerated truck, loaded, uh, loaded, loaded and packed somewhere with, with vaccines, and then other, 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 others moving there from, as a, from, from a spoke to, to wherever. Because yesterday I saw a doctor in Michigan who, as soon as they, he realized that um, the vaccine was going to be need uh, frozen storage, he bought storage, foreign storage. But one of his facilities is like three hours away. So he removes the vaccine from the frozen storage and start driving. Those, that, those two hour driving is a two hour driving it takes to tow. And then when it reaches the facility in the rural area, he puts it in the fridge and it last five days. So basically, these things can be worked out, but it's the, it's the, it's the hesitancy of people to deal with certain things that is important. As soon as people agree and they put their mind to it, they get, get a, a problem solved. So my question was, what do you think? Or what do you think? Would that be something that could be considered? Or do you think that if the vaccine was not developed specifically because now the, the, it was not tested in Africa, it may not be useful? I think um, that's now not on people's minds about where the vaccine was developed, how fast it was developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, people are starting to believe that actually uh, all these companies that are working towards development of vaccines are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So it's an issue of beating the challenges that we have just discussed and getting it to the people. I, I think generally there will not be um, non-acceptance of the use mm -hmm. uh, in Africa or in Kenya. That's my view. Okay, okay. So basically what you're saying that as far as you're concerned, if the vaccine were available today in, in Kenya, people will line up and get vaccinated and that will be done. Yes, it would. Okay, and uh, what, what, what would the government's reaction be if, uh, if, if it, so it was not basically involved? Because uh, basically, I, if, if the vaccine becomes scarce, then you know how resources are located in situations like that. You understand? So what about what would be the situation if, say, it will be a pilot or something in some place? So what, what, what would be the reaction? Uh, it would be well accepted. And I think the government is, uh, is inclusive in terms of the fight towards COVID. Anybody who is able to put something on the table and it's proved that actually it's working towards uh, combating this uh, pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. The government is cooperative on that. In fact, um, I've just gotten information that anybody who is developing a vaccine and has an agent in Kenya mm -hmm. can apply for emergency use authorization and that will be given. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That, that's, that's good because, you know, we, we need to put, first of all, uh, the idea that governments should do everything that doesn't work. Even in the United States, although the, 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 the research was done by government, 
the development of, of, of the vaccine was handed over to private sector because private sector, when they focus on something, they do it. So the basic research was done by Na National Institute of Health, but the all all the all the all the pharmaceutical industry was invited to see what they can do to make a to go a, to make a crack at it. And the problem of vaccination is also another one. The logistics of delivering the vaccine to people's arms is also as as large as that one of developing a vaccine. So uh, Morgan, what do you think about? Because the problem of developing a vaccine was big. We have handled that one. The problem of delivering the vaccine to people is also a big one. And in the US, they have said, and people are saying the community should get involved. Do you think that that should also apply in Nigeria and in Kenya and as it applies here? I, I, um, I, com I agree completely with that uh, concept. Uh, as you know, here, uh, the projection was that by tomorrow, 20 million people uh, would have been vaccinated. And as you know, that as of today, it was only 2 million plus. Uh, only about 11 million plus uh, vaccine has been shipped Send out. Mm -hmm. um, so we see that uh, the pace, the logistical challenge, um, either is, was not fully anticipated or articulated or was somewhat um, um, kind of minimized or they felt they had every logistical things in place uh, to handle it. And that has proven to be very, very unstable and uh, untruthful. Um, my concern from the get-go, which I have expressed on this uh, platform, is that manufacturing of vaccine is one thing. Distribution is another thing. Breaking the hesitancy is another thing. Yeah. If all these things are not pursued concurrently, mm -hmm. then we are not going to achieve herd immunity through vaccination. That is the truth. And as it stands right now, um, I don't see so much being done in Africa logistically to put things in place. I think that communities, people like uh, Ruben and what he does in Kakamega and all over needs to begin to think outside of the box. How can we be stakeholders in this? Because at the end of the day, all of us are affected. Yeah. You know? So I agree for that community engagement, community participation, Actually, yesterday, one of the thoughts that came across my mind is how can church leaders who have a variety of expatriates in their church utilize their church buildings or spaces within their church for COVID vaccination? Because that is going to work quite a magical. If somebody knows that they can walk into the mosque or into the church and that there are uh, standardized CDC, FDA approved measures that have been put in place within, let's say, for your example, where you fellowship and victory Christian. That, you know, how many people can benefit from that? Who will many. know that, okay, this is, this, uh, and I can get to my church and be vaccinated. One is that they feel comfortable in that environment. Two, they trust the establishment. Three, those who may be volunteers are trained uh, who are trained volunteers are people they know, they are fellow parishioners. Mm -hmm. That will break a lot of hesitancy. So there are many things that can happen to really meet this goal of vaccination as against just keeping it within the orthodox medical units and hospitals and, and all that, where people may not still have trust and faith in. So I think community engagement is a key if we're going to come out of this. Uh, Ruben, you know, being a follower, yeah. uh, Ruben, what, what were you saying? Sorry. Yeah, I totally agree with Morgan that um, this thing must actually be kind of community-based so that uh, that hesitancy is, is, is eliminated by virtue of somebody associating it with a person he knows indeed Yes. has received a dose of uh, the vaccine and he's okay. 
rather than say putting people strangers together and they are vaccinated they may not have say an immediate reaction there and there uh, but the fact that there's a, a community follow up can be a plus in um, eliminating the hesitancy that uh, most of us would be having the fear of so that approach i do agree with it okay and then you know you know Ru you know ruben uh, i normally say this there is nobody else behind us it's us you know this is if, if you're talking about somebody in Kagamega, that's you if you we're talking about uh, people in, in uh, immigrants in the us that's us there's nobody else behind us if we don't get this thing done there's nobody who's going to do it. The idea of saying that government, you know, Ruben has been in government. Most, uh, Morgan, you have worked with government. You know, government is just people like you. So the point, <laughs> the point, the, what the point I'm making is that in as much as uh, government is supposed to um, uh, to facilitate or make the uh, environment uh, uh, suitable for us to do something, it's us who have to do something. We have to tell the government what they want because we hire these people. So. Ruben, say, suppose, uh, like you said, that if somebody has, a, has a, a vaccine and a trial and they want to get, they will just, you, you, you as a community, as a site can just apply and you get, a, uh, you get the emergency, a, 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 a emergency use. The emergency How, use authorization is available. How would you move on with that one? Uh, okay. The relaxed the regulations on how to import uh, medications and medical devices. Okay. In that case, because this is um, uh, a life-saving product, okay. that company that manufactures or that company that has access to the to to the vaccine mm -hmm. has to appoint an agent. That agent then in Kenya will have to go to the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. Mm -hmm. and request for emergency use authorization. So to be specific, uh, let's assume that your organization or the one you, 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 you actually pitch for mm -hmm. are able to get the vaccine and it's proved that they can actually follow the cold chain mm -hmm. and deliver a safe product. Mm -hmm. We then have to do a letter and appoint somebody, appoint a, a legally registered and practicing pharmaceutical company as an agent, then that company goes and applies for the emergency use authorization and they are given an import license and a permit to have that product say for uh, some time. So that is the starting point that two um, entities must come together and convince the government that they have put structures in place to have this product actually safely. So basically, you have to get the, the structure in place, the infrastructure in place, okay? And then to certify the logistics and the cold chain, and then you get uh, you get somebody, you get the approval, and then you get it in. Uh, what, what, because uh, uh, if it is uh, under study, Obviously, the participant will it will be free. But if it's a commercial, then somebody's gonna pay. So, what, 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 what how is the government to consider to, to looking at the at the the, the, the the twenty-four million? Is it paying, or the customers are gonna be paying? Now, what I read is that uh, the government is going to spend about three dollars mm -hmm. uh, per dose of the vaccine they are going for, mm -hmm. and. Um, the user will in some way pay for it. I think our universal um, health insurance, which is NHIF, may be actually remodeling so that it can cover um, the people who will benefit from that if they, if they are paid up members of uh, the National Hospital Insurance Fund. Other insurance companies, of course, they're charging um, quite heavily if you have to go for the vaccine. It won't be, uh, definitely it won't be free in Kenya. I don't know what the situation is in America. You know, Ruben, this is a public health. If I get the vaccine and you don't get, I am not safe. <laughs> I need you to get the vaccine because I need 
any percent of the people in Kenya to, to, in the country to get so that I know I'm safe. So basically to putting that burden on people to pay, Morgan, just tell me, just, just specifically what do you think? <laughs> uh, Dr. Amakobe, we need to be frank mm -hmm. and honest um, and to realize that the environmental factors, social factors, political factors, economic factors, in the West, not the same back in Africa. Uh, yes, you and I know this is a public health issue, but um, we know how things happen in Africa, and unfortunately, it doesn't go the right way. Um, public health issues are monetized in Africa. Uh, corruption um, is something that is so riveting in Africa, my own country, Nigeria. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even know where they're beginning with because there is a level of denialism as to the reality of COVID in, in Nigeria. Um, and then you look at the political landscape, a lot of corruption exists. So people want to make money out of anything. Doesn't matter who they make it from. So. There is no thinking of this is a public health issue. If you, are, if you don't get vaccinated and I vaccinate, I'm vaccinated, I'm not safe. They don't think like that. That's mm -hmm. not the mindset. Let's, let's not just fool ourselves. That's not the mindset. And because that's not the mindset, that's not the disposition. So to Ruben's uh, point, I think, um, to your point, not to dispute the fact that uh, there is nobody behind us. That's true. But in this case, we need to realize that resources is needed to do everything that is being thought about that is necessary to be done. Mm -hmm. The mobilization, the education, the sensitization, the infrastructural building, the community uh, networking. Each of those require resources. And you and I don't have that resource. Can we leverage on the freedom of information here and the power to participate in the democratic process? Yes, we can. Can we make our voices heard uh, to the point where people who are in policy making decisions can make policies that can help in the distribution of vaccines in Africa? Yes, we can. So I think we need to begin to look at ways that we can do things uh, as against looking at people in Africa governmentally as to what they can do. Um, I, I, I don't have faith, sorry to say it, um, in most of the African governmental institutions for them to really take this seriously. Ruben, They're not going to make money out of it. Ruben, yeah. This yeah. Is, this, you, you are the guy. You, are, you, you know what, when you go to the club, those people you are seeing looking, you want to go to church, those are the people. Just uh, uh, like you say, you know, I think people normally think that you need money or you need um, uh, equipment, but you actually just need people. You need people make the decisions to create resources, to make available resources and stuff like that. So what would you, if you sat down today, uh, how would you plan? Say, so suppose you say, okay, I'm going to plan this thing and go through it, make sure that I've got 20,000, 10,000, 10,000 people vaccinated in Kakamega. How, is, this, is it a, a, a project you can take on? And how would you go about it? Yeah, uh, Morgan has rightly put it that um, we do not have much faith in government institutions to actually deliver to everyone. So people must come up and organize themselves in whichever um, formation to make sure that actually everybody gets vaccinated. Coming now to your specific question, how would I go about it? Uh, already I have an, um, a platform as community health services, and I can uh, very rightly say that I'm able to get uh, these products within the, to the community. And all that I need is a, a government support in terms of um, 
of rightly getting the products in and the government will have to ensure that it's being uh, stored safely and it's being administered safely. So we would start first of all by targeting. Uh, and then we say out of say a population of 10,000 people, where do we want to start? We give the priority say to those who are um, uh, working within hospitals. Then we go to the vulnerable poor in terms of age group and in the rural areas, of course, you will, you will have most of the vulnerable people. Most of the poor are tired there in the rural areas. So we identify that and then go get that emergency authorization uh, to bring the product in. Many companies and many organizations, I believe are already doing that. So we would model our process on what say Kenya Red Cross Society is doing and any other organizations that would be lumped together as um, those that are doing it out of goodwill. Okay. Uh, uh, Morgan, uh, in, in the US, we, uh, we are talking about uh, registering your facilities so that uh, you can get uh, the immigrant population. How, I mean, whether you like it or not, that's the you know, new, if you don't do it, we look back and say, Morgan had opportunity, he didn't do it. So what, what are you thinking? No, it's not necessarily what I'm thinking. Uh, I think that the, the challenges here is not the same with what Ruben is facing and my heart goes out for him. Mm -hmm. My heart goes out for him because he's a good man and a good heart, a good organization uh, who wanna help. Uh, the yeah. logistical difficulty, the political maneuvering is very hard. And I speak as one who has been uh, politically partisan in Africa and involved, and I understand how these things operate. Um, for New Life Foundation, uh, we're looking that at the commencement of the new year to um, go through the process of officially uh, flying and doing the registration. Uh, we do have uh, expertise that we can leverage upon in terms of nurses uh, who are licensed and registered and all that. Um, also, we kind of seek to uh, find a medical doctor who can oversee uh, that process. The intent is to target Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, and to uh, bring them in uh, into an environment of familiarity and, uh, where cultural competency is quite uh, pronounced and they are able to be understood, not dismissed. Their questions are answered and their fears are really uh, are mitigated by honesty. Um, and through people who look like them. I think that's what we set to do uh, beginning this January. And hopefully, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, instead of Delaware, would uh, work with us to ensure that this is I think that the, 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 the Delaware st State will work with you because as long as you're delivering the vaccine properly with uh, with the... Um, with, um, with professionals who are registered with Delaware, I don't see a problem. You know, you have to, the, the, the point is if you don't ask and if you don't push, nobody knows you're there. And after that is, uh, you, you'll be able. Ruben, I think, thank you for coming. I think we have been talking for the last one hour and I think we need to go back. So we need to, which, and now this has uh, been an hour. That's, this has been a very, a very free flowing discussion. And I think we need to stick on it because the responsibility to make sure that the people we know are vaccinated rests on us. This a thing that somebody called government will do it should not be in us because government, I think as far as I'm concerned, as long as government makes the place safe for you to move from one place to another, the other responsibility is on you. Even the responsibility to be able to tell government what amount of money or what resources are required is on us. Government, like uh, I was talking to somebody, I can't say them. They said, you know what? People in government are not mind readers. 
unless you tell them your problem, they will not be able to know your problem. So as you have to be able to say what needs to be done and how it, need to be, it needs to be done, and they find a way for it to work. So Ruben, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we'll call on you again so that we can see how it's going and we'll see whether we can be able to pull something out of the hat. Or do you have something else to say? Um, okay. Um, actually, it's been great talking about this uh, to you people out there. And I, as I look forward to engaging with you more and more until we find a solution as fast as the, we can. Because if we leave it, it go like this, the earliest officially that Kenya is looking at a vaccine is 2024. You can imagine how many people have been lost by then. So I, I would want to count on um, organizations like uh, yours and that of uh, Pastor Morgan to see how they can actually chip in. And we leverage on this um, information technology that we are able to get right uh, directly without going through the government protocol and uh, we see how to help our people. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think the government, as long as the government put the structure there, we'll, flow through, we'll make sure this stuff flows through it. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Ruben. It has been a pleasure talking to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Same Happy New Year to you.